Um, but it's, it's been a wonderful time. And um, like, you, like you know, my name is um, Cloud. Um, it is, it's quite interesting, though, because it's, it's, it's followed me all the days of my life. <laughs> <laughs> it's been there, you know, since I've been young, I've been called Cloud and Clot and all, all a lot of names, but the one that stuck was Cloud and eventually it got turned into Volk um, that became my gamer tag in my BC days. <laughs> so I used to go by Volk, you know, and it was quite interesting. Um, so thank you, Yaku, for that, that I had to brought it, bring up some history and some past days. Maybe, maybe, but I, I'm, I'm grateful that Conrad actually redeemed it because he spoke about the cloud, in, you know, in the distance and something is about to happen, so I, I really feel like something is about to happen, um, so, <laughs> so <laughs> I'm so grateful. Uh, thank you, Conrad, you're awesome, and uh, I just felt like that, you know, that was more prophetic and that's where I feel <laughs> more at ease, so it's wonderful. I'm, I'm married, I've got a wonderful, beautiful wife, and she's got the most incredible FOMO at the moment, and I had to promise her that next time when I travel anywhere that I should bring her with. So she sends her love. I've, we've got two beautiful children, and I am also part of Josh Jen, where we serve and we lead the congregation in Montague, and we've been part of Josh Jen now for a year and two months, and God has been doing amazing things in uh, the it's really the most beautiful town, and if you've never been, you can come and visit. It's a town of love, I hear, um, Montague. Yeah, because certain people uh, met there and, and fell in love in Montague, Ross and, <laughs> and Margo. So if you um, single guys and girls, just come to Montague. Um, we'll arrange something for you, you know, so... so. <laughs> Uh, yeah, we'll scale that mountain for you. Uh, so um, it's, it's really a privilege for me to be here. Um, and being in Namibia, I love the hospitality. I must tell you that Sammy has been amazing, even through difficult times with Judah that had to travel back to his family home. Um, Sammy was amazing, and we had Kevin and Cheswa joining us, and we had wonderful times up to this point, and they just wonderful, and it's really, it feels like we've, we've um, made family. The one thing, though, I can tell you that I've experienced in Namibia is, yo, guys, the driving, eh? Huh? The stop street is not a stop street here, it's like a suggestion. Um, a few times, and it wasn't just in one car. It's not like it's just Sammy. It's Kevin, Sammy, Andre, everybody. It's like, what are you doing? There's a stop street. And, um, yeah, it's, it's like, and there were some times that they, you know, you guys go into the road with other cars coming. Like, they're there, and you just you're like, go. It's, it's amazing. Um... I'm not, I'm not sure if I should be, you know, I'm thankful that I'm alive, but uh, it must be the grace of the Lord upon you that you are still alive because you're doing it daily. Um, but it was something interesting for me. Now, I'm, I'm here today to end off, which is normally the graveyard shift, I think, but it feels to me like it's not. It feels to me like God is doing something. He's stirring something in us. And just uh, b before Ross came up to bring his word and the wonderful tools that he gave us, I really felt like even in that short period of worship, like God is preparing an altar for us. He's really preparing an altar for us where we can really lay down our lives. And even though we, we might not be everybody, won't be there tomorrow because some people are traveling back already tomorrow, I really believe that tonight, and that's why we won't be worshiping now, but we will be worshiping later, is God's going to prepare an altar for us where we are actually going to lay down our lives as a living sacrifice. Because ultimately, it's a choice that we have to make. It's not something that we will be forced into. It's a willing sacrifice that we make. And I, I'm so grateful for every sermon that came to the front, every person that preached, because it was almost like if you've got this picture of, I don't know if you've ever torn a ligament or, a, or something, you know, like a muscle, and you go to a physio, and, uh, 
and they start working you. You know, and, and when they get that knot in the muscle, it's not like, oh, here it is, let me just re release my hand from you so that you don't have pain. It's like, oh, I've got it. <laughs> and they press it in. And it's like, it's like, oh my gosh. And I think like, as we came in last night, even Thursday night at the lead elders, and even Wednesday night when we came to worship together, um, it feels like God's got us on this table and he's, he's trying to find the knot. And when he gets it, it's like he's pushing it in. And it's not like he's doing it, he's doing it with everyone. He's even doing it with me. He's doing it with each and every one of us. It's like he's, he's got his finger in there and he's like, man, just pushing it. It's like working it. And then until he gets that release and then he soothes the muscle again and then he puts some oil. I get water in Aaron's mouth, I get a Thank you. I thought, now Christ, you for me, now I water, thank you, thank you, Len. Not with them. Thank you. I think it's part nerves, but it's also part of the weight that I feel like God wants to push on us today. Um, I think he's really busy with us. You know, when, when we are a people that are called to worship, called to lay down our lives, and like Ross has said, um, we're called to die, it's not an easy thing to, to face. It's really not. So I want you to turn... If you've got your Bible, to Romans 12, and um, it's a very, very known verse, and probably you've heard this type of preach multiple times, but this stays a foundational verse for us as Christians. Paul's speaking to the church of Romans, and he says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Now, in that one small verse, you can read every message that you've heard this whole weekend. You can read every message. You cannot worship the way you want to worship. Because God is holy, you've got to worship Him in a holy way. Because you have been accepted, you now worship Him also in an acceptable way. In actual fact, in that, in that small verse, you find three words in one little sentence. And normally, Paul, when he writes sentences, it's long sentences. But three words that, that jump out at you. It's like, present yourself, which is also translated as offer yourself. Which it means to, to place a person to one's disposal. It's like Conrad placing himself to his friend's disposal. That's offering myself. That's, that's the word. That's the first one, presenting. To put something aside, somebody else, to present an offer. The second word is sacrifice, which is... Nobody likes that word because we've got this weird theology sometimes in our minds that think because Christ has paid the ultimate sacrifice, I don't need to sacrifice. I remember one time speaking to a friend of mine many years ago, and he said to me the following words after he, he really hurt a church, unfortunately. I asked him, why are you doing what you're doing? He said to me the following words, he said, Christ died for the church, I don't have to. Christ sacrificed, I don't have to. I asked him, where do you get that? He says, no, God, God's grace covers everything. Yes, but you no. Know, there's a reality that we should understand that God has called us to sacrifice our lives. We are following Christ. And if he was the ultimate sacrifice, well, how do we think we will not sacrifice. The third word we see in that verse is worship. Worship. It's actually the word lateria, which where we get the where we get liturgy from. And if you think about liturgy in a gospel context, is liturgy in Afrikaans, is we can stumble on liturgy. You know, 
the way we worship, the way we do church, the way we like things. We've spoken about all of those things. That's the word. It actually means service. It doesn't, liturgy, liturgy is not, we've got a guy standing in front introducing somebody. We can do that any other way. It doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. What matters is our service unto the king to give ourselves. So in all of that, I want to say to you this morning, and you've got to realize this as we prepare our hearts for worship, is that we are called to worship. We are called to lay down our lives. We are called to give everything. And we sing it so easily. But I think, like in Ross's sermon today, it's the practical parts that are so difficult. It's the tools, the, the actual nitty-gritty, the relationship part of it that's difficult. But everyone here, if you think about it, God is busy with you. He's busy with you right now. He's been busy with you since the moment you've walked in to this building. Even when you walked in last night, he was busy with you. Like he was busy with that girl that just decided to get baptized today. God is knocking on our doors and he's tugging at our shirts and he's saying, I want to have everything. Because we are called to be a living sacrifice. The other verse, obviously, that, that stands out when we talk about worship is the foundational verse for this is John 4. John 4 verse 24. And there, it's Jesus speaking. It's not Paul. It's Jesus speaking to the lady next to the well. And he says something amazing. He says, but the hour is coming and is, is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. So there's a way to worship God in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such people, and that's what He's doing right now. He's at your heart's door seeking you. He's asking you tough questions. He's convicting you by His Spirit, seeking you because He loves you. And He's saying, for the Father is seeking such people to worship Him. And then this, verse, uh, this sentence is like, God is spirit. And those who worship him must. Paul says, I appeal to you. That's the most I can do today, is appeal to you. That's what Ross did. That's what Conrad did. That's what Lynn did. That's what Unre did. We appeal to you as servants of the Lord to give your lives as a living sacrifice. But Jesus didn't use the words, I appeal to you. He says, those who worship me must worship me in spirit and truth. You see, the defining factor here is not the fact whether we worship him or not, is how we worship him. There are many people that are worshiping him, thinking they are doing the absolute right thing in the right moment, but they're not worshiping him the way that he wants to be worshipped. They're not worshiping him in spirit and in truth. They're not worshipping Him on the foundation of the truth. They're worshipping out of their preferences like we heard. They're worshipping out of their comfort like we've heard. But they're worshipping. There are many people that are devoted to worship. But they're not devoted to the Spirit of the Lord and the truth of His Word. And that's a question that you've got to ask in your heart today. How does my worship look? Because it's not... The act of worship of jumping up and down in front of the stage, that's not what we're talking about. That's, a, that's an outward expression of an inward reality. Something that took place in me. And for that reason, I worship. I give myself. And when we say, like I said today, I believe God is preparing an altar here today. It's not for you to just come and jump up and down but it's for you to come and lay down your life, which will have an effect on your tomorrow and your Monday and your Tuesday and your Wednesday and on your farm and on your family and in every aspect of your life. Because if we worship Him in spirit and in truth, it means every thought, every idea, every plan in our hearts should be surrendered to Him. Amen. Should be surrendered to Him. It's a must. 
2 Chronicles 16 verse 9, and I love this. One of my first favorite verses is, For the eyes of the Lord. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth. Even Namibia is running. To give strong support to those whose heart is blameless toward him. Again, here's a defining factor. The defining factor is not that your heart is somewhat towards him. The defining factor is that your heart is blameless towards him. He's seeking true worshippers. He's seeking true worshippers. We all love Mervis, right? If we have to call, you know, name a guy in 412 that like exuberates worship, it would be Mervis. For me, he's that guy. I know him for a very long time, long before I became part of 412, Josh Jean, I knew, I knew Merv way back. I know him longer than what I know my wife. And one thing, when I meet and drink coffee with Merv, is that we don't sing together. We don't jump up and down together. We, we don't, you know, suddenly just jump out and prophetically sing to each other. That would be. But you know what? This lives in his heart. He's blameless towards God. His heart is turned toward God in everything. When he went through the most difficult time, I remember I knew him that time when him and Sonia couldn't get children. His heart didn't turn away from God in anger. It was blameless towards God. When things didn't work out, at the time when I met him, he was, he was in a parrot church ministry. He was roaming around. He was confused. So was I. But then, his hope, because his heart was blameless, God was constantly seeking him, and he was constantly seeking God. God is seeking you today, and he's seeking me today. Now, I remember when... Um, you know, because there's this journey of the living sacrifice. <laughs> if we're called to be a living sacrifice, there's this journey that we're on. And, and um, you know, speaking to some of you guys, you can see that through the years of your life that you've constantly, continually needed to sacrifice in order to please God. Because He's seeking you and you're laying down. I remember um, I, was, I was in ministry in... Um, in a traditional church, when I, when I didn't think it was traditional, I thought it was quite hip and cool. And, uh, and, but I did see the flaws in that church, even when I went and studied in 2000, became a pastor ordained in that, in that movement, and, and, uh, and I honored God, man. I tried my best. I did everything I could. And uh, I really tried to please God. I was a worship leader at most, so um, I worshipped every Sunday. In the last, from 2014 to 2018, I worshipped and I preached every Sunday. And, and that's tough, but you get used to it. And you're like, yes, I'm pleasing God. I'm definitely pleasing God. But here's the interesting thing about my journey, is that I... I longed for the presence of the Lord, and I still do. But we had countless times in the presence of the Lord. You see, because the thing about the living sacrifice is that a living sacrifice doesn't stay on an altar. <laughs> it's not like, I mean, you put an altar and then it's like, oh. <laughs> you know, a, a, a sacrifice with a will of its own. It's like, you put it on, you turn around to get the knife, and it's like, oh my gosh, where is it? Uh, we had countless times in the presence of the Lord where we experienced amazing times where people were falling under the power of God's Spirit. And we were like, yes! And like three weeks later, like, 
All the steam is out of you because nothing has changed. You had a wonderful experience, but nothing has translated into the lives of the people. Nothing. And I'm like, I'm trying my best. I'm worshiping my socks off. I'm worshiping God. And I'm like, guys, you need to jump up and down. There was even one time I remember this. I like, stop the worship. Everybody go out of the church right now. And you check your hearts before you get in. (laughs) We're here to worship. I remember doing that. Because I thought that if I can polish this cup on the outside long enough, eventually a genie will come out. It never did. It never did. The reality is, we need to change from the inside. We need to die to the flesh. God is seeking those who are blameless towards Him. I remember, how did it change for me? Well, 2020, I was invited by Len to go to a week like this. There was a bunch of leaders all over the world that came together in Sunningdale, and I went. I was an apostolic faith mission pastor, and um, I dressed accordingly. So, so I went to this place in Sunningdale. Didn't know what to expect. Len was inviting me. I liked him, so I'll go. And I was, looking for, I was looking for spiritual leadership over me. And I walk into this place, and there's a bunch of oaks with surf shorts and pluckies. <laughs> and in a moment, I feel like, you know, when you, you stand out, you're like, stand really out. I mean, and I, I, I thought I was like, I was, I was like casually dressed. I mean, really casually dressed. I mean... Button shirt, not tucked in, jean, close shoes, middle of February, Sunnydale. Stupid. <laughs> Walked in there, checked this bunch of oaks. I'm like, what the heck? Okay, 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 all right. Um, Conrad was there too, definitely. He's in, it's something to be old when you see him for the first time. So. <laughs> <laughs> So, especially when you see socks. Um, and then this, Andrew started speaking. I never met Andrew before. Andrew started speaking. And something happened. I got, I didn't like it. I just didn't like it. You see, I, I heard things and, I, and, and, and actually... What was happening in that moment is I walked in there without knowing it with some pride in my heart. I walked in there not to learn, but actually to check, like Lloyd said, check what these oaks are all about. And when I checked, the first thing I saw about Andrew was like he was trying to get people settled, like Lloyd just tried to do it unsuccessfully. And Andrew didn't get it right. And on the board, there's this like apostolic leader for 12. And I'm like, apostolic leader? And people aren't listening to him? To come and sit? What's happening? So what was happening in that moment was God was like showing me in a mirror the dirt in my own heart. This is how I feel about the body. Judgmental. Then Andrew started speaking and I didn't like it. Andrew said a few things. I dotted down what I didn't like. It was, and, and then I was thinking to myself, I still have a whole week of this. Oh, gosh. Phoned my wife that evening. I said to her, I don't think I'm going back. And she said to me, you're going back. <laughs> and when you, it's, it's like Len said on Friday night when his mother said, Leonard, Leonard, I knew in that moment I'm going back. <laughs> I'm going back. She said to me, Take, give it another ch- shot. That next morning, worship started, and uh, Andrew came up after the worship, and he, and he said, guys, before we start, I just got a few things that I, I feel I need to clarify, and I need to repent that I said a few things that could have been taken out of context, and um, I don't want you to miss my heart here. 
uh, I said something wrong, please. And he went down a list, and it was exactly my list. And I was like, what, what is this? Some, somehow, God opened my heart. And I think in some way, God is doing exactly the same thing with you today. Where he's, he's weighing your heart. He's testing your heart. I had another test that week. Something terrible happened at, in my local congregation back in Montague. And, I, and the leadership demanded me to come back. And it was a test. You see, you'll, you'll get to places like this and you, you'll be tested. You'll be tested. And I couldn't, I couldn't understand what was going on. It was my first conflict in that congregation and, and, it, and, it, and it hurt me. But what happened was I had a friend in Merv and I spoke to him and he said to me, you stay. God wants to deal with you. And I, and I, and I listened. I actually postured my heart because of Andrew's vulnerability. I postured my heart to stay. That Friday morning was the last morning. I walked into the building and Mervis was worshipping and I was standing at the back of Sunningdale. And in that moment, I couldn't worship. All I could do was prance around at the back because it felt to me like I'm about to die. Literally, it felt like I was going to die. And in that moment, it was God standing in front of me and said, Claude, you think you know what church is all about. You went through your whole ministry in the AFM thinking you can change it from the inside out because you've got the golden ticket. And I'm telling you today, you don't. But I'm giving you an opportunity to bow your knee and build church my way. <laughs> I remember I took a plastic chair, a white chair. we all fond of those white chairs in Josh Jen. And I knelt and I cried before the Lord. And within about five minutes after me crying out before the Lord, because I really felt like I'm dying, it was like almost I'm going to get a heart attack here. Andrew made an altar call. And he said, there are leaders here that want to build healthy churches, but they need to surrender their lives to Christ. They've done it their way. And I'm like, no, man. I've been standing at the back. I'm okay at the back. Have you ever been there? Being okay at the back? Being all right at the back? I've been there. Until God calls your name. He says, I'm seeking you. I want your heart. I want all of you. I want you as a living sacrifice. So basically, I went to the front. You know what the Lord said to me that day? I never expected this. It hit me like a, uh, like a hammer. I stood in front of Andrew and this is just the way that Andrew has been used by God. He's an obedient servant. He's nothing more than that. He's a leader that's willing to lay down his life, and he's doing it again. He stood in front of me, and he said to me the following words. He says, God is going to cause you to break down mighty strongholds. But first, he's got to break it down in you. Now, I'm going to speak to the leadership of every church for a moment. Guys, if you think that the external things in your church are the things that need to change, you're wrong. You need to change. If you think only if we had more worship leaders, it would be better. Even if we had more of the prophetic, we would be better. Even if we had just, I mean, maybe if we were just, you know, a better building, it would be better. You're wrong. None of those things matter unless they're built upon Jesus Christ. The only thing that matters is that you are willing to put your life on the altar so that God can take out the muck that you have accumulated all the years of your life and say, Lord, I hand it over. I hand it over.
I, I have done many things for the Lord in my own strength. And I count it as nothing because it's nothing. It's absolutely nothing. It means nothing. It means nothing. We've built buildings. And we were so arrogant in our proudness that we said, we don't want our names on there. We don't want it. We want God's name on there until somebody wanted the building and we didn't want to give it. Because idols aren't on placards, they're in our hearts. They're in our hearts. And each and every one sitting here need to realize this, we are all carrying idols to some extent. And that's why it's a living sacrifice. Dependent on the one true sacrifice that was eternal for us. Is this woman that walked into a private party where Jesus was in Luke 7. He was invited by a Pharisee. And just let me remind you that the Pharisee wasn't a bad guy. He wasn't a demon. He was a church dude. He was a church dude. Serving in the church. Giving his life for the church. He invited him for supper. And there was this girl that stood by the entrance waiting because she knew Jesus would be at that house. And when he reclined at the table of the Pharisee, she came in with perfume. Now, by all buster flask, perfume. An interesting thing about that, if you put it in Luke 7, 38, it says that she first cried at his feet. And then she wiped his feet with her hair. And then she anointed his feet with oil. What a beautiful picture of worship. She worshipped God. She offered something that was so beautiful. But it, it didn't come without a price in a sense because here's this Pharisee and he's like looking at this picture and he's got this thought in his mind and he's like, if this was a prophet, he would have known that she was a sinner and he wouldn't have even touched her or allowed her to touch him. You see, we've got enemies that subtly creep in and steal worship from us. And we've heard of this countless times. Ross has spoken about this. But this Pharisee wanted to impress Jesus. Maybe that was his way of worshiping Jesus, checking him out, you know, going to 412. Is this Jesus really what he is? You know, let me just give him a coffee and lick what he's doing and then... Suddenly there's worship that breaks out spontaneously. So I want to say something. I, want to, I don't want to spend too much time because I, I want us to really come to the altar today. Is that there are a few things that can actually stifle our sacrificial worship. They come in subtly. It's like that yeast. It's like that seed that's been planted. It's like that stone that Conrad said. And, but these ones that I'm touching today aren't superficial. They're deep-rooted problems that can come into our lives. And the first one is pride because that was what was in the heart of that Pharisee. It's pride. Psalm 10 verse 4 says, In his pride the wicked man does not seek him. That's not the one. Psalm 10 verse 4, 
In his pride, the wicked man does not see God. In all his thoughts, there is no room for God. In that moment, that Pharisee had Jesus in front of him. The Messiah, the one that he's been waiting for, the one that he's been proclaiming from pulpits, talking about in home groups. But his pride kept him away from worshipping the King of Kings. Do not let pride come into your life today. Pride comes in subtly. Pride separates us from God. It builds that gap. It separates us from others. It blinds us. That's what Coronet spoke about. The root of that problem is pride. I don't want to see what you see. I hear what you're saying, but here in Namibia, yeah, it works different. Well, that's not what Paul said. He said, this is the message that I preach in all the churches. And you need to model it in all the churches. I had an email the other day and somebody says, you know, we like, like the idea of your church. On paper, it looks good, but we don't think it's going to work here in Montague. It's not the type of church that will work here in Montague. What is that? Pride. It's pride. Can you pay for the sacrifices of your sins? Can you pay the price of your sins? What's the answer? No. Can you carry the weight of the sin of the world on your shoulders? How the heck do you think you know how church should be working? There's only one who knows, and that's Jesus. And your pride can keep you away from worshiping Him within the church, which is His body, if you're not careful. You will worship Him. You will bow down your life in a sense to him, but you will not surrender in truth or in spirit to him. Galatians says, for anyone who thinks he is something when he is nothing, deceives himself. You see, pride compares between people, compares, and the result of that comp comparison is justification of actions. So I look at Yaku and I look at him and he says something to me and I, I compare and I think to myself, no, but I think, I, I think better than what he is. You know, I've been in ministry longer than what he is. Nah. So what am I doing? Pride has taken a hold in my life. I'm comparing my life with his life and now I'm justifying my actions for not working with him. That's what pride does. It separates separates. Romans 12 verse 3, which is, we started with Romans 12 verse 1, it says, hey, for by grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. You see, I didn't realize in my life that I had pride and God had to reveal it to me, and he had to kill it. And in a process of more than three years after that, through COVID, God had to, had to kill it in me because it didn't kill in one shot. It, 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 it's, still, it's still there. It wants to come up, and I have to constantly say, Lord, I'm laying it down. I'm laying it down. I'm laying it down. One of the other things that stood up in that moment where that lady came and she gave that sacrifice of worship unto God was human traditions. It stood glaring her in the face because you know what? It's not proper for a sinful woman with sin to come into this place to worship. That's not what Jesus thought. That was what the tradition said. That was what the human law said. And tradition can creep into your heart you see the interesting thing about you guys driving without stopping is that it started somewhere. It started somewhere. 
And because everybody is doing it, and it somewhat works, you're sticking with it. But is it right? Now, I'm not, I'm not coming to you because, I mean, we do rolling stops in Montague too. We just get fines when we do it. <laughs> is it right? No. Here's the problem with human traditions. The battle to stop it. Worship, true sacrificial worship, stops human tradition from making a kangaroo within the church. But once that kangaroo is set in and everybody is used to it, how do you stop it? Can you imagine? And this is, Len said it, offense is like a fortified city. Try to stop the rolling stop in, in, in Vintuk. <laughs> That's going to be a battle. It's like a fortified city. You're not just going to stop it. First guy's going to do it. You're going to start a campaign. You're going to say, guys, we're going to do it. No matter if anybody else does it, we're going to do it. Because this is the right way to do it. Are we willing? You see, Jesus said in Matthew 15, 6, So for the sake of your tradition, you have made void the word of God. How many things in your life are built upon? Ah, this is how we've done it. The dreaded word. This was not all they did in winter, couldn't it? It's not just in Namibia. You know, guys, I want to tell you this. I feel like God wants to forge something in you today. Because there's a purpose that nobody else can carry but you. I've been feeling that in my heart since Thursday night. When Ross had that picture of the army of the Lord, that he's raising this army and there's strategy coming to this place. This is this moment. And it will go out. It's not just going out to Namibia. There's something that's built in you in the fire of God's altar that will burn away the traditions that's been nagging at you for years and years and years and generations. He will burn it away, but what he will be forging is a sword that will go into the rest of Africa. Because you are built differently. You're built differently than South Africans. I can tell you that much. I've seen it. God's going to make you a gateway. I trust for that. But in order to do that, you need to lay down these things that could actually harm the unity of the church. So, the last one is agendas. Agendas. Hidden Agendas, unaligned agendas. Have you ever experienced the clash of agendas? Agendas? There's the other story of Mary washing the feet of Jesus with oil. It's a separate story that happened for the burial of Jesus, but there was an agenda from Judas. When she wanted to worship, he had a different agenda. His agenda did not align with God's agenda. His agenda was self-soothing. It was for himself. It was for his own benefit, for his own gain. But God's agenda was sacrificial. He honored the worship that was sacrificial from Mary because his offer was sacrificial to us. He will always honor sacrificial worship. And for that reason, we need to be aware of agendas in our hearts. I had to, I had to check this in my own life. And I think we all had to. 
as a young man growing up before I became a pastor, uh, I've served as a worship leader or in the worship team, but I thought to myself, I had pride in me, I had all of these things in me, but actually I had an agenda in me. I wanted to be known. I wanted to be famous. I wanted to be the man that leads the team. That was my agenda. And I had a, we had a wonderful team. Um, my brother-in-law was leading the team. But then I started quibbling with him about song selection. I was quibbling to him with, about everything. And it became an atmosphere until a day that he actually took me in front of my chest and he said, why are you opposing me? I said, what are you talking about? He says, no, everything I say, everything I do, every song I select, you like got a problem with it. I said, yeah, well, I think I can do it better. He says, well, you're not in the lead here. I am. I said, well, my dad's a pastor. That's how immature I was. Until God got a hold of me. In that same day, we had a worship team or an eldership team coming from another church. We had a services. And God had a moment, and I stood in front. I said, Lord, I want to serve you. Lord, I want to serve you. And a man came and stand, stand, he stood in front of me, and he said to me, I rebuke that rebellious spirit in you. And within a second, I fell to the ground because without knowing it, I had walls of agendas and pride in me. And I had to learn how to submit. And it took me 18 years to serve under one man, my own dad. I don't know if you've ever worked under your own father. In business, in church, in everything, it's not easy. But if God keeps you there, he wants to teach you something. And he did. He taught me how to submit to leadership. He taught me how to yield my heart. That's why when I walked into 412 in 2020, it didn't take long before God softened my heart and I yielded. Because a yielded heart brings worship to God. He sacrifices. A yielded heart is what God is looking for. A yielded heart knows that the sins that they carry are great and that there's only one Savior. That's what a yielded heart does. A yielded heart knows that they have received the life from death. Do you understand that the cobbles that we have and the things that we allow to create the gap is nothing in comparison to the life you have received because you were dead in your sins? And Jesus paid the complete price for those sins. And my prayer for you and for me tonight is that we will yield our hearts to God's ways of doing church, to lay our lives down, you see, like that girl that pushed past the ideas and the thoughts of the Pharisees, we have to push through the ridicule of traditions and cultures and all of those things. So we will worship Him because He's worthy to be worshipped, no matter. And we might face some onslaught. We might face some tough dis discussions, but we will not compromise. Because a yielded heart to God yields his heart to the King of Kings. That's what that lady did. But in that moment of worship, she also stood up against culture and tradition and all of those things that may have held her back from the King of Kings. So in our worship, we actually yield to the King, but we do not compromise on the things of this world. We do not go and live our lives as a double agent somehow. And the reason why we can do it is because a yielded heart. I think if I look at that picture of that girl, it's not like she was wondering what the people would think. I think before she went in, maybe that thought crossed her mind. But the moment she was at the feet of Jesus, she didn't see the Pharisee. She didn't worry about what he was saying. She had her eyes fixed on Jesus. Here's this beautiful verse. I want to end with this. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 6 to 7. So for God who said, 
let light shine out of darkness, has shone into your heart. Just think about that for a moment. The God that created the heavens and the earth has shined a light into your heart. There was a day that you came and you heard the call of God in your life. Shone the light into your heart to give light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. We were talking about the glory. What is the face of Jesus Christ for me today? I, I was like, we went to our first gathering in Para as a congregation and one, one of our community leaders were, was standing and he was singing and worshipping and he's saying, Lord, show me your glory. Show me your face. In that moment, Jesus said to him, open your eyes and look around you. And Josh Jen was worshipping. And he said, this is my face. This is who I am. As living sacrifices, Peter says, we are living stones being built up into the temple of God. Right? If I lay down my life, and Conrad lays down his life, Eduardo lays down his life, we all do it. And we join together in unity. And we behold Jesus each in their own United together, something beautiful happens. There's a knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus. And we have this treasure in jars of clay. Amen. Every one of us here today, we've got battles, we've got issues, we've got things. We're constantly on the operating table. God is constantly working on our hearts. But the reality for me and for you today is if we willingly lay down our lives. Because here's the thing about a sacrifice. It's, it's willingly. And maybe one more story before I end, and let's go to the altar. Shaul had this beautiful picture of Abraham and Isaac, and Abraham willingly laying down the gift that he received. And that picture was in my mind about from two weeks, three weeks ago when I started praying, and I didn't know if I had to preach on it, but when Shaul said it, I realized that there's something, and I said, Lord, what do you want me to see in this? And just in worship earlier, I saw something beautiful. You see, we look at Abraham and the sacrifice that he made, and he would be the father of many. But when you look at Isaac, my question would be is, what, what we don't read in Scripture is we don't read the reaction of Isaac. We, we don't read how he postured himself in that moment. But we don't see that he was fighting against his dad. That's, we don't read it. It's not in Scripture. To me, it feels like he somehow willingly laid down his life in the hands of his father. It's the first time in the Bible that you get the word worship. When the question was asked, asked was, why, why are we going to Maria? Abraham's answer was, we're going to worship God. There's something that God is building here today in Namibia when we spoke about the leadership. Ross actually so beautifully shared that. Abraham, probably a type of the leaders of the church, Willingly laying down any leader here. Andre, can I maybe ask you a question? Maybe come to the front. I want to ask you the question here. This is now stepping out in faith. Are you willing to lay down crowded house for his glory? That's the heart of Father. It's the heart of Abraham. He's willing to lay down crowded house for God's glory. 
Isaac's heart and posture was, as I saw my dad following a living God, I will lay down my life for that living God because my dad wants me to. Yaku, can I ask you a question? Are you willing to lay down Kietman's, that church, for the glory of God? It's hard of a father. Can I, can I ask you to stand in front of him? Shaw, are you willing? Go stand. Who are the other ones? Yaku, Vashe. Ishe. Okay? Go start for it. I don't think it was an easy thing for Abraham to lay down his son. Because each and every lead elder, elder here knows and understands that God has given them something. A child. Something that they need to present one day back to God. And the very gift that he received, he was willing to lay down. And this is the heart of a lead elder. I remember sitting at the 2022 conference and Andrew had a similar thing where God asked him, are you willing to lay down 412 if one person can come back to the Lord? And he said, yes. If these men are willing to lay down the churches for the glory of God in a sense, the question then remains to the sons in the house, are you willing to lay down your lives for the glory of God? Are you willing to put your life as a living sacrifice on an altar? How do we do that? Because can I do it on my own? No, we've heard we can't do it on our own. We need to live our lives out in the church, the body. But here's the picture. Like Ross has showed us, it's from God, anointed to the apostolic, which we know is Andrew and the team, to Namibia, these elders, are we willing to lay down our lives as a living sacrifice, not to them, but to God? That means when they say, guys, I need you to sacrifice a bit more for the glory of God, you say, yo, it's tough, but you know what? I'm willing to. I know it's tough, but I'm willing to. You see, because a living sacrifice means nothing for Christ unless, unless it comes from a willing heart. None of these men will force you to do anything. None of these men will force you to go to the ends of the world if you're not willing to. But the reality of Isaac's heart, Abram's heart was when he willingly laid down his life on that altar and Abram lifted up that knife Christ was given in a sense, in a type, through a, life, through a ram. Abraham, God spoke and he gave. We have received all things pertaining to life and godliness through Jesus Christ. This church, 412, has, has got everything they need for the life of godliness amongst us. If we are only willing to lay down our lives. Can I ask the band to come up? Yaki donkey. I wanted them to stand in the front because I believe they need to be honored. I was talking to Andre. I didn't have a lot of time to speak to some of the other guys, but I was speaking to Andre yesterday, and I realized the sacrifices that he personally has made to see the kingdom of God established in Vintuk. We are saints called to be holy and acceptable before the Lord. Are you willing to lay down your life before the Lord? It's my question. One question. Now, I'm not expecting it to be an easy thing for you. I'm not expecting you to come and run up and jump up and down because I, the last thing that I want for you today is to do it from an external place without weighing up the cost of sacrificing your life before the Lord. 
and this sounds terrible when you say it that way, but it is what, what Paul says. I appeal to you, brothers, to offer your lives as a living sacrifice, your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable before the Lord. And in this moment when we create this altar, where we come to the altar of worship, uh, whether it's pride, whether it's tradition, whether it's agendas, lay it down and allow God to operate in your heart. And then, willingly give yourself to serve within the body and to follow the leaders that God has appointed. Willingly lay down your life. God is forging us to be a mighty army in His hand.